Welcome to Jesus Changes Everything, a daily podcast dedicated to providing a fresh look at the ancient and glorious truth that Jesus not only reigns, but is busy about the business of bringing all things under subjection, that celebrates the wonder and the glory that he has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. It's time once again for another one of our ism segments. And today I'd like for us to consider uh, that uh, ism, which is not really an ideology. It's much more a practice. And that is the word vandalism. Vandalism. V-A-N-D-A-L-I-S-M. Vandalism. Now, you may or may not know this, but uh, during the uh, Middle Ages, there was a uh, group of what were considered to be uh, barbarian tribes uh, who brought destruction to uh, what were considered to be the civilized parts of Europe, who were called Vandals. And I'm guessing, though I don't know for sure, that these Vandals were uh, somehow connected to uh, the Norsemen, but I could be wrong. They could have been part of the Genghis Khan crew or some other group that I don't know much about. I'm, I'm exposing my ignorance here. Uh, but I do know that's where the word comes from. Vandalism is the practice of the uh, willful and malicious destruction of the property of others. The willful and malicious destruction of the property of others. I like that definition. I think that's uh, full and rich and deep and accurate. And to unpack that, I want to ask this question. Have you ever wondered what motivates people to practice vandalism? What motivates people to practice vandalism? And I, I'm going to uh, posit a couple of suggestions. The first is simply this, that we practice vandalism because we're sinners in rebellion against God. And acts of vandalism are acts against our created image-bearing nature of creating, of building, of exercising dominion. That because it is rebellion, we like to destroy rather than build. That there's something uh, just, in, in essence, it's a it's a attack on uh, the image of God, which is the closest we'll ever get as sinful humans to actually being able to attack God himself. The second motive is related to the first, very much so, um, but a little bit more specific. And I, I first heard this idea uh, from my father, who I suspect uh, first heard it from the recently deceased uh, Dr. Gary North. He said, uh, my father said, uh, that what goes through the mind of the vandal is different from what goes through the mind of a thief. The thief looks at what I have and says, I want to have that. That should be mine instead of yours. And so he takes it. The vandal may be feeling that same sense of, I should have that and you shouldn't, but recognizing that he can't get it, takes the view that if I can't have it, you can't have it. It's not so much greed as it is envy that fuels the practice of vandalism. Now, you may think, hey, R.C., this is a lot of time and energy to uh, invest in a habit uh, that leads kids to uh, do graffiti or break windows or this or that. Is, is, isn't this just, aren't you making kind of a mountain out of a molehill? I think not, and here's why. 
Because if, if my father is right, and again, probably learned this from Dr. North, uh, if he was right, that means that acts of vandalism are not just sins per se, but they are violations of the Ten Commandments. That an act of vandalism demonstrates a heart that is covetous. I want what you have. I'm discontent with what I have earned. I'm discontent with what God's providence has brought into my hand. And I'm going to demonstrate that discontent by destroying what belongs to you. It is a profoundly unnatural uh, kind of sin and really reveals the depth of the darkness of our own hearts. We are destructive. We are envious. We are discontent. We are greedy. So much so that we will take things that are beautiful, are excellent, and we will make them ugly. We will paint a mustache on Mona Lisa. We're a fallen bunch, aren't we? May God give us grace to reject the folly of vandalism. We have a duty and an obligation to be faithful to our spouses in thought, word, and deed. I want to suggest that one of the great evils of decline in the broader culture is the effect that it can have in the Christian culture. As the broader culture becomes more and more morally slipshod, immorality is defined downward. Christians tend to be comfortable if we can manage to stay ahead of the world's curve. Sadly, when it comes to marital fidelity, it seems we're not even doing that. Evangelical Christians, or so the scuttlebutt goes, are virtually just as likely as their unbelieving counterparts to commit adultery. Our infidelity, in one sense, is much worse than the infidelity of the infidel. In both cases, of course, families are torn asunder. In both cases, the lives of children are turned upside down. But in the case of professing Christians, we add to that that we are lying to the watching world about who Jesus is and who the church is called to be. That is, when a man is unfaithful to his wife, he says that Jesus is unfaithful to the church. When a wife is unfaithful to her husband, she says that the church is free to be unfaithful. Christ. This follows, of course, from Paul's connection of the husband and wife and Jesus and the church in Ephesians 5. These lies are no small things. It is, after all, one thing to lie about how big the fish that got away was, but it is entirely another thing to lie about Jesus and his bride. We ought to be modeling for the world what fidelity looks like. We, of all people, ought to understand this call. After all, Jesus was faithful, 
even to the death on the cross. We fail here in the end because we're worldly. While the world walks into marriage, seeing it as something temporary, and we walk into it thinking it designed for permanence, what we have in common is how we view the purpose of marriage. We both, believers and unbelievers alike, walk down the aisle believing that marriage exists for the sake of our own happiness. When our marriages no longer provide the level of happiness we believe is our due, our eyes, our hearts, and our bodies begin to wander. We begin to look for excuses to escape our marriages. We walk into adultery step by step. We will not improve here corporately until we recognize and repent of this scandal. God will not forgive us until we have a broken and contrite spirit. The solution is not more marriage retreats. The solution is not more careful premarital counseling. The solution is not the repeal of no-fault divorce laws. Those all may be good things. But we will change only when we see that we are one flesh with our spouses. That infidelity is a failure to be faithful to ourselves, that hurting our spouse only hurts us. We will change only when we remember that God gave us our spouses as a gift, not a burden. We will change only when we recognize that physical adultery isn't a new sin but is merely the end of the road we begin traveling when we look at another with lust, whether that other is a pinup girl or the hero in a romance novel or the nice person at work. May God have mercy on our marriages. You've been listening to the Jesus Changes Everything podcast a production of Dunamis Fellowship, the teaching outreach of Dr. R.C. Sproul Jr. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we encourage you to subscribe, which you can do at all the usual outlets, to tell your friends, and to spread the word. To learn more about the work of Dunamis Fellowship, please visit rcsproulgr.com and join us next time on Jesus Changes Everything. Everything.